um, and they refer to them as yeggs as well. Uh, so, you know, your, your basic hobo, and, and when, a, when the labor movement started, and a lot of the organizers started writing with the hobos, the Pinkertons would zero in on them to kill them because they wanted to break strikes. They wanted to break any kind of uh, labor insurrection that might start. And what they really wanted to do was, was stop organized labor before it ever got started. You know, so very often in Chicago along Madison Street, which was where the biggest hobo jungle in America was, the police would come with dogs and bats and chains and they would just wholesale have police riots. Now, we saw a little bit of that in 1968 with the Democratic National Convention. Picture that, but no cameras looking. And uh, absolutely no fear of reprisal. Um, at one point, Clarence Darrow uh, wanted to defend Joe Hill, who was framed for murder. He was a hobo songwriter and a labor organizer. And in 1911, he was framed for murder. The case was appealed three or four times, and in 1915, in Salt Lake City in Utah, he was executed by firing squad. The United States government has since apologized and admitted he was wrongly executed. Um, he was executing, he was executed for trying to start a union. And uh, the war on hobos was really the war on the labor movement. And it was the war on working people. Um, Back right, you know, right after the Civil War, they had all of America scared, much like George Bush had people scared after 9 11. And they thought this, this labor stuff is tantamount to socialism. It is going to be the end of your rights as a worker. It was an excuse to keep people working 10 to 14 hours a day for, uh, for not a living wage. Um, in New York here, I mean, you know, the, the shirt triangle factory where a couple of hundred young Jewish women perished doing sweat labor, uh, making garments. Um, that happened because they did not have a union. Um, now in 2009, once you come out saying that unions are a good thing, I mean, have, have the room wants to you know, throw your ass out. But if we only work eight hours a day and we're paid a decent wage, we owe it to the labor movement. That's who secured those things for us. Um, this one here means uh, um, get off the rails. This one means get out fast, which I chose to. It's, it's always good advice for me. You know? uh, this one here, the triangle with the hands out like that, which means man with a gun. And you very often saw that around Chicago, in New York, in New Orleans. Um, the railroad bulls in every other province were not allowed to carry firearms. But after the labor insurrections, after, after Joe Hill was executed, hobos started fighting back. And railroad bulls and Pinkertons were allowed to carry firearms. So you saw this symbol uh, in, in the Penn Station uh, trestles in uh, the, the New Orleans and in New York. Um, you constantly saw that symbol because the, uh, the guards were allowed to carry firearms for the first time. They are no longer allowed to carry firearms. Um, railroad bulls now, they, they carry a nightstick and, you know, some spray, you know. Where were they written? Like, were they on, were they on the cars? Were they they put them on trestles, they put them on the cars. More often than not, you would see them on trees. Uh, most hobos were smart enough to get the hell off the train before it got anywhere near the yard. Because once you got off in the yard, you ran into bulls. You ran into guys whose job was to beat your ass up. Um, uh, when, when, when the labor movement got involved in riding the rails a lot, they were a lot smarter about this. So they had little depots and little dumps a couple miles out of town and about a mile off the tracks. Um, most trains, uh, to avoid hobos, they would try to cannonball through the first few miles. Well, that's also where the switches were, so they couldn't effectively do that. So the trains would move slow enough that they could get on it. Um, you know, it also took the railroad a long time to get hit to the uh, hobo alphabet. You know, 10 or 15 years, they just thought, 
They thought of it the way we think of graffiti. They thought, oh, those fucking kids, you know. And this is this was a language that was being spoken, uh, you know, nationwide. Um, with very little difference, the Hobo alphabet does not change a lot from north to south or east to west. You know, in the cattle country, in the, in the logging country, there are a few more things that are specific to lumberjacking and things like that. But pretty much the nationwide, from the Civil War on, um, it didn't change very much. And uh, any seasoned hobo, anybody who's caught two or three rides was pretty fluent in all of this. Um, a lot of them have uh, the crucifix as part of their construction. Um, this one back here means uh, church people in town uh, talk religious and they'll feed you. <laughs> um, a great many hobos would have, you know, Sunday morning conversions. And, uh, <laughs> there were communities that were hospitable to hobos, you know, particularly in the South. Who, who, who felt a real connection because a great many of them had a father or an uncle or a brother who rode the rails just to find work. So in the South, there was a great more bit more hospitality. There were, on occasion, soup kitchens and, you know, the Salvation Army uh, always fed people no matter what the circumstance was. Um, but once you got out West, once you got to Arizona, California, Nevada. It was open season on hobos. And uh, in Barstow, California, you know, a bunch of United Mine Workers organizers got off the train and they were executed by a gunfire. They were shot dead with impunity and nobody was ever arrested for it. Um, so as, as things got tougher, hobos got a little smarter, you know, in fact, a lot smarter. Um, you know, the last of the hobos, there are still guys who live in this hotel in Barstow, which is a hobo hotel. And they're like in the late 80s and their 90s now. Um, um, but, you know, a lot of hobo culture kind of went away with the late 50s. Um, the railroads became more sophisticated. Uh, they automatically locked whole lots of cars at one time. And if they put one of those things on, uh, on uh, you know, up in dry dock, you know, they were finding bodies and stuff like that. So, you know, hobos moved on to hitchhiking and, and, and other ways. Um, uh, but, you know, when we think of the term migrant workers, the first migrant workers we ever had in this country were Americans who'd had enough of the Civil War and uh, uh, Americans slaughtering sometimes their own brothers in, in, in warfare. Um, I, I talked to one older man who ridden the rails all the way through the 50s. And he said, you know, he goes, I did it because I consider myself a free-range human being. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it's, it's been rewarding because the whole thread of this alphabet works its way through American literature in a way that's really meaningful. Um, through Nelson Aldrin and Jack London and James M. M. Kane and uh, Jim Thompson and Charles Williford. Um, there's, uh, there was a, in, in the South, a lot of hobos were often steel roosters. And everybody would think, well, they're, they're gonna eat it. No, they would have cockfights and stuff. And uh, there's a marvelous movie by Monty Hellman called Cockfighter, where a guy uh, bets Warren Oates at his absolute best and best, um, bets his money, his trailer, and his girlfriend <laughs> on a cockfight. And he loses. <laughs> so he has to hand over you know, the money and the trailer, and then the, the girlfriend was a little hard proposition, but she eventually went. And then he takes a bow of silence and rides the rails and finds every great fighting cock in the Southwest, and vows not to speak a single word until he becomes cockfighter of the year. Some guys have different ambitions. <laughs> but uh, 